Coming up in this edition of TV Black Box, Seven's big boss wants big changes to the TV rating system. ABC Love is in a lather over a nude Skype call. And is Channel 10 on the comeback trail? I think they just might be. Welcome to the podcast where people in the TV industry get their news. This is TV Black Box. This is TV Black Box. Bringing you the inside goss from the TV industry. We'll say hello to the panel in just a moment, but it was during this week in television history, homes changed forever. Sony released its first videotape recorder in the US in 1965 for a whopping $995. The average weekly wage at the time was just $57. It was, however, a discount on the first VCR ever produced. That would have cost you $50,000. Here in Australia, we had to wait another 15 years before we could press record ourselves. All right, let's meet the panel. Please welcome to TV Black Box contributor Aaron Ryan. Hello, Aaron. Hello, gorgeous people. Magazine writer, Philip Kosh. Hey, everyone. The viewer's advocate, Mulk. Press record. TV and radio presenter, David Robinson. Hello there. And actress, Sarah Monaghan. Hello, Sarah. Hello. I am still in country and loving it, although someone could turn up the temperature. Please. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> you made a mistake. You came at winter. Mm. Hey, talking about that um, VCR, Philip, and Mulk, you... You guys would probably be the only ones old enough to remember. Um, when <laughs> VCRs first came out, there was no remote controls. Obviously, we know that um, Beta was the better version, but because of the porn industry, VHS took off because um, yep. Sony stopped the porn industry from using Beta or Beta Max, mm -hmm. and VHS was the tape of choice, and that's what made VHS sales go through the roof. Additionally... I remember when we had our first remote control for the VCR, which was on a long String. wire from yes. the VCR. Yes, yes, yes. And it literally had a play and a yes. pause. Yes. <laughs> and the pause, you'd get the big static line in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> My grandparents had exactly that where they plugged it in. Yeah. Philip, what was your first VCR? How, how, at what age did you get it? What year are we talking Oh, look, I, I grew up on the rough side of the tracks, Rob, so I, I think it was wild, wild that we Hips were waiting for. Hips were all for stolen. I, I, <laughs> much, I have one memory of VHS, and that is um, as a school kid watching some porn at a, my parents' <laughs> holiday house and trying to hit stop when they walked in, and we hit fast forward. So that was awesome. <laughs> And instead of coming, she went. What I love is you say you were on, you, you, you were on the wrong side of the tracks. You had a holiday home. <laughs> it wasn't in Sydney. <laughs> By home, he means lean to. Um, my thanks for asking, Rob. My memory, earliest memory of uh, uh, having a VCR at our place was uh, we were living on the Sunshine Coast in the eighties, and uh, I think it was Video Vision was the video store chain of choice, and we had my parents had purchased the the VCR through them. And and that meant that we had like you know espresso pods. We had to go and get a certain number of videos every week to help pay off the VCR and stuff. And we we turned up one week, and they'd gone bust. So we were left with oh. a copy of Gandhi the movie, um, oh. the Village People's <laughs> You Can't Stop the Music, um, something else that I've wiped from my memory. And I think my parents had a video I wasn't allowed to watch. <laughs> <laughs> was it the joys of sex? That was seemed to be the, the video of Robert, parents. What do you mean the joys of sex? Oh, I don't know what that means. Not the there are two words in that sentence anyway. I don't understand at all, and I've got two kids. <laughs> of and the. Sorry, uh, the the only video we had was Convoy, and my brother, who is a truck driver, loved Convoy, and all the time I'd hear, we, we got, got a great big convoy. through the night. And uh, I threw that tape out probably about 10 times and he retrieved it from the bin every time. <laughs> oh, here's, here's another quick little anecdote. Um, my baby sister loved The Sound of Music, the movie starring Julie Andrews. I think she was a mini Koshy. Um, and 
we, so my parents taped it off television one night for her. Because it runs for an inordinate long amount of time, the VC, like the tape ran out at some <laughs> point in the film, started rewinding. Someone was in the room and saw it happen, quickly pressed stop and pressed record again. Oh, no. <laughs> so we, <laughs> she would come home and watch The Sound of Music most afternoons as a little person after school and – I remember watching it sort of uh, as I grew up and went, I don't remember this 20 minutes of this movie at all. And it happened to be the <laughs> bit that had the 20 been minutes that was lost when it rewound. And stuff. It was like, hang on, she just went from being here to being there. There are Germans? What? Oh, yeah. And the introduction of long play changed everything. Oh, everything. Oh. People who yeah. record it. Anyway, let's get into the news stories. <laughs> Seven boss James Warburton is on the offence, making two big calls when it comes to streamers and ratings. First, he urged the Labor government not to force streaming services to invest in local content because it would only drive up the price of making Australian TV shows and films. He said the network celebrates the requirement to run 55% of Aussie content between 6am and midnight, but said they could do without the artificial competition. It comes as screen producer Producers Australia pushes for a 20% quota on local content for streamers such as Netflix and Stan. But Warburton has once again joined in the debate about overnight ratings, calling for Oztam to finally abandon them altogether. He said publishing such data is not representing consumers' increasing changes to viewing and that the industry has become complacent on the issue. Um, without wanting to delve into the ratings chat where it's just Mark, Karen and I and the rest of the panel take a, 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 a no-dose and have a bit of a sleep. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Mark, there's a couple of big calls here. Um, first, the local content. This is interesting. I was under the impression that the TV networks wanted the streamers to have content quotas to even out the playing field. Mm. But interesting how Warburton is coming at this because he's thinking, hang on, if they're all making productions, Aussie productions, yes. the ones we want are going to increase in price. This is an interesting side effect of content quotas. Yeah, look, it, and it is the case. Mr Warburton is the only person to have made this assertion, and he's a very smart man. He, he's, I think, got the right call on this one as far as um, how it will affect the cost of production. And for someone like Seven, who no longer make programs themselves, mm. everything is a is a purchase. They have to be aware of what the impact of that's going to be on their bottom line. So uh, a, a reasonable call and one to be aware of. I think it was also in this speech that, that, that Mr Warburton also mentioned Oh, look, I, it, I may have read it somewhere else. Apologies for being apocryphal. That he said to to the industry writ large, give the the ratings thing, like give the national ratings as opposed to Five City Metro, give it a couple of weeks or give it a month run, and then let's see how we go. Like to 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 kind of test it out. Um, and in that regard, Mister Warburton is becoming a drug pusher because that's exactly <laughs> how they work. <laughs> Just try it. And then we'll see how we go after the fact. <laughs> well, different because you don't get your daily fix. Yeah. Oh, I think he's asserting that you would get the daily fix. It's just including regional mm. in the full number. So you get all three. You'd get three No, figures. no, but he's also saying you get rid of overnight. So that, well, to me... In that regard, so that's an even bigger different situation, isn't it? So all of a sudden, yeah. if, it, it turns the conversation about ratings into... Not even a conversation about ratings. We were talking before about dinosaurs, and I think this is the thing. I've always thought of the internet and streaming services being out on the horizon, and 7, 9, 10 uh, are on the veranda of this outback homestead, and they can see this massive, you know, dust storm coming, and they do nothing about it. Uh, look, I haven't thought this through properly, but it'll be fun <laughs> for us to uh, think about it. And that is, could it be possible that one of the free-to-air networks becomes a streamer if they jump the gun. Now, I think people overall would agree that free-to-air broadcast television in Australia is not going to be here for a long, long time. Aren't they already, Robbo? Like, legit, but, no, no, aren't they no, no, already no. streamers? You mean no, only a streamer? Fully only a streamer. If someone had the biggest step, hold on, if someone had the biggest um, step and, and had the courage to go, you know what, the 7 Network, the 9 Network, Network 10 are going to be streamer only. You're going to pay for it. We'll have a new service. We'll do all of this, but we are going to get away from terrestrial television because that's the future. So if someone did that first now, 
could that not be successful? Because that's what does the it future. achieve? By turning off a revenue stream of linear television, because it, at the it, it moment, does, it, it, even it gives a, you longevity, doesn't it? it because but you the, can still start the transition process to streaming, which uh, Nine does with Stan, and they've got their yeah. online catch-up services of Nine Now, Ten Play, and but they're Seven all rubbish. Plus. Can I can I just say quickly on that? I, mm. I used to get a lot of taxis in Sydney, and and they would say to me, "Oh, do you get Uber?" And I said, "Yes," because Uber has the better app. They've got the better um, program. You can see where it is. And and taxis was the legacy brand, obviously there. Yeah. But they never caught up with an app. And it, and you think, well, if Uber has an app that works, it it can't be that hard to create one. That's what I see here, where, you know, streamers of the Uber and taxis are saying, well, we've we've got a catch up service. It's nine now, seven, seven plus ten plate. They're all shit. If you compare them to the to the way that the other streamers work, they are. Absolutely rubbish. Even SBS on demand and iView are better than seven, nine, and ten, which to me makes it seem like they're more dinosaurs because they won't put the the investment into the infrastructure of those playback services. They're rubbish. But it's happening. So here's here's the problems I see. Um, I think they are slowly making the transition. But slowly, you're not going but to isn't stop. That rob- slowly. They're just yes, slow. I, I agree. Um, the problem is that you're not going to cut off a revenue stream. We have to remember a show on one of the commercial networks in pri- in a primetime slot of 7.30 can get, let's just say, 800,000 in the five-cap cities. So that's not even national. If it's that lucky. means as an advertiser, you have the potential to have your message delivered to 800,000, 500,000 even people at the one time. No other medium gives you that reach, okay? Now, I know that we're talking total TV now and national figures, and and I'm really on the fence now about what the metric should be, whether it should be total TV, whether it should be overnights. The one thing I would say about this is when you're talking about advertisers, it's about them getting their message out. So if they are seen, uh, let's take Home and Away, right? What's that doing? 500,000, 400, 500,000, 600,000 now? Give or take. You're right. So let's just say 600,000. Home and Away is doing 600,000. I am McDonald's, okay? I put an ad into Home and Away. I'm reaching 600,000 viewers in that slot on the seven network, five cap cities. Now, unless I then buy the spot in other markets, the national markets, my spot, my McDonald's spot, might get to 700, 750,000, right? And then if you want to include Total TV, it's only beneficial to me as McDonald's if my spot is also being seen by those um, BVOD services. So when you go and watch it on 7 Plus, if my spot is in there. So when we're talking about Total TV... It is certainly an interesting proposition to talk about a holistic number and waiting seven, is it seven days? Are we going to wait 28 days? It's an interesting proposition to give the the full number of how programs have performed. But as an advertiser, is it beneficial to me when I might only be advertising through a traditional linear method to try and reach a broad audience or even an audience or even a show that caters to my demos? Um, nothing else, and I repeat it, nothing else matches the broad reach of television. You can talk about digital marketing and digital placements. They do not reach the same way as television does as far as getting a message across with a video element. Just before Aaron jumps in, because I know he'll have something valuable to add to this as well, both you and Robbo are in part right, Rob. The difficulty is he's coming at it from the consumer point of view with, with you yes. know, some, um, you know, some interest in, and understanding in the medium, and you're coming at it from the other angle. I mean, we we have known for years now that the network sales teams are not just trying to sell McDonald's, the five city metro stuff. They're trying to sell them a national package and plug in your BVOD, you know, uh, catch up ad packages as well, which is why we know when we watch the streamers to, to catch up on Home and Away, we get the same bloody ad every bloody ad break. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, that, there isn't a slew of ads like you get on traditional linear No, broadcast. because they're not all taking it up. And that's 
That's the concern and the challenge in the midst of this um, that delays Robbo's plan. Although it's weird, Mark, because I do know that advertisers love catch-up because it's an audience invested in the show. They're watching it online. They can't skip it. You can't skip the ads. And I do know that within advertising circles, catch-up is a is a sexy proposition. Mm. Forcing people to watch the ads a la Clockwork or in style um, <laughs> is a great return on investment. You can guarantee the audience have seen your thing. Well, or not. Yeah. I, I recently tried to watch something on Channel 7, catch-up, whatever it's called. They have eight ads in every ad break, eight. It was unbearable watching it. I just gave up and thought, never again. So I'm just, Where is now, that's YouTube? my in the point of view. On YouTube, you can pay the $15 a month subscription and just get rid of all the ads. Are people willing to pay for broadcast television as a streaming service? But that's the that streaming be the next proposition, proposition. Right? But, Aaron, you've remained quiet. I can see your brain bubbling away. What would you like to contribute? Look, I'll just say I definitely understand the point that James is making. Um, 100% it's a valid point about overnights. I mean, when we say, see that 50 million people have watched Squid Game, it's obviously not people that watched it at 3 a.m. on the day that it was released live. I mean, that's over a, you know, a day, a week, a, a month period. It's not t- talking about, um, you know... A, a live element um, and if you look at shows like especially US dramas like 911 and The Good Doctor 200,000 um, in overnight not great at all but these US dramas on 7, 9 and 10 are all getting 70, 80 percent 90 percent uplifts across the week so obviously um, to advertisers they want to show look well, this is how many people are actually watching this show uh, uh, across that period However, I do think that overnights have a place. I think it's like a jigsaw puzzle. They're one piece of the puzzle. So I, sure. think, I, I think when you're putting out data, you know, th- this is what happened in the overnights. This is, you know, what happened after a week. This is how many people are watching on, on BVOD because people are watching it differently. As I said, US dramas is, is very different to the news and obviously live sport where people aren't catching up later. So it's just about having the, the complete picture. So I understand why he wants to get o- rid of the overnights. I don't think he actually really believes that will happen, but it's just the point. And that, that was the point uh, Mulk was saying when he was saying, even if we can get rid of, rid of it for a month, he was talking about the, the overnights, you know, for a month, just to see what, what sort of data it is that comes out. So I think it's interesting a point, though. The only challenge I'd make, Aaron, and I agree largely with what you're saying, is is that the US drama's getting an 80% uplift. is looks great in the context of the percentage, but when they're coming off a low base, 80% of 125,000 viewers is not a huge lift. It does yeah, help, but they are getting an audience, but a big uplift off a small number isn't as good as a 15% uplift on the primetime show that got 550,000. But as Rob said about having a mass audience, there's still about 500,000 people, half a million people in Australia watching 911 as an example, or The Good Doctor, which is even more. So, I mean, there's still a, a big place for, you know, these shows and, and for advertisers. So, well, the, and this piece is a part the the total TV numbers that we've we've talked about ad nauseum. Sorry. All right, the motion is from James Warburton oh, that we get rid of <laughs> overnights. Are we working on consensus or just a sheer vote? Consensus, and if I don't like it, I'll put the gavel in my disagreement. Sarah, do we I... get rid of overnights? Sure, why not? Robbo. Yes. Philip? No, absolutely not. Aaron? No. Mulk? I agree with my learned friends. Hell no. Okay. We have two in favour. We have three against. This is solid podcasting, people. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'm open to the idea. I think he I has wasn't, Sorry, I wasn't aware that the fence was an option. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is like a Robin <laughs> sex club. I'm no, open to I, the I, idea. I'm going somewhere with this. Uh, Your Honour, and I'm Your Honour. <laughs> yes. I'm talking to myself. You can't Your do Honor, that. That's not how this works. Can I have some leverage? Well, you better be going somewhere, McKnight. I am Your Honour. Oh, Bear God. with me. <laughs> High quality <laughs> podcast. Yeah, um, I, I think James has a point. 
I think there's a couple of things he's trying to do to increase the overall perception of television numbers, and I understand that. But, and the big but is here, does he want national? Does he want total TV? There's a couple of different arguments. I don't think at this point in time we are ready to get rid of overnights, and I think he needs a stronger case, and so the motion is denied. We will not be removing overnights for the time being. And I'm sure right. the seven boardroom are shaking at this announcement. You would be surprised. They all listen. They all listen and they all see what the, the what you've got to understand about this podcast is that we are lovers of TV. We talk about the product that they make and they do listen because they know we care. And we're not being smart asses. We're not being assholes about our opinions. They might still disagree. But I do think this podcast um, sometimes speaks for the industry. It's everyone's dirty little secret. <laughs> yeah, we are. Everybody says they don't listen, but they we all know they do. Anyway, for Network 10's biggest shiny floor show, there's one thing that isn't masked, and that's the exit sign. Oh, my God. Jackie O is the latest judge to say goodbye to the mystery singing show following in the footsteps of Denny Minogue and Ursula Carson. Rumours are running hot. Are they deserting a sinking ship? Jackie O took to Instagram and said, it's been an incredibly tough decision, but I've decided to step away this year. Filming always coincides with school holidays, and after three years of missing out, I've decided to spend my mid-year radio break holidaying with my daughter while she's still happy to hang out with the mum. The Herald Sun reports fellow radio personality Abby Chatfield will be her replacement. Dave Hughes is the last person standing from the original lineup. Now, this is interesting, Philip, because there was an article on TV Black Box suggesting this may be a line divided by radio alliances. Yeah, well, Abby works for the same network, doesn't she? So, um, As Hughesy? I'm sure there would be some cost savings there too com- with the two salaries if you compared Abby to Jackie O. Mm. No, I was, just, I was just going to say, that said, but look, I've always found Jackie O quite fascinating in that she seems to be quite passionately pursuing a TV career and yet nothing really has ever worked that she's done on TV. You know, she wasn't great on Pop Stars. Australian Princess was a disaster. Two words, Thorpey's Angels. <laughs> okay. <yeah. laughs> I just uh, look. She's so successful on radio. Perhaps it's it's a challenge that she's just desperate to succeed at. But you know, I don't know. Maybe stay in your lane. Maybe she's given up on TV because she's one of the highest paid people in radio. Radio stars actually earn more than TV stars, and. If, you know, sometimes work-life balance makes a difference. There's a couple of parts at play here. Sorry to jump in on you, Philip. One is, yes, there's some cost saving to be made. Also, as Kevin Perry, who wrote the article on tvblackbox.com.au, rightly pointed out, um, Jackie O it works for ARN and Abby and Husey work for Southern Cross Osterio. Which was what I was who just are, saying. Yeah, the regional partners of that. And and just to boot, somebody, and I can't remember who they are, I apologise, has commented on that article and said, isn't isn't Jackie O hosting Love Island Australia now in lieu of no, Sophie Danny. Monk? Is Danny, hang on, Danny went over no, to No, 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 Danny's doing the show about like yeah, just a boy. She's going to do a UK thing. So... I, I do recall reading something around this. I do believe it is Scuttlebutt. I can't confirm that that's the case. However, it would make sense that Jackie O's off to Spain and can't do The Masked Singer. TV Black Box bringing you Scuttlebutt since 2018. Oh, full of Sarah. it. Sarah. I, I just like Channel 10 to know that I don't have children and I am very available on the holidays. <laughs> I, I asked Sarah, I said, are you staying in Australia because you're doing The Masked Singer? And she said, I can't sing, Dal. And I said, that doesn't stop them. <laughs> That's right. Um, can I just make a point about Channel 10? I think the show will be fine. It's the format, not the people, as much as I love Jackie O. I, and I do, I, I disagree. I think Jackie O is actually really good talent on TV. I just think she's never found that project. I think that's the problem. Um, Mars Singer was a good fit for her. The Mars Singer has been the only thing that's worked for her. Yeah, um, which she was really great in. Uh, to me, Mars Singer will be fine. Uh, maybe they'll bring back Lindsay. Maybe not. Maybe they'll find someone else. Uh, it, you know, they'll, they'll cast that. A- well. Abby Mickelson's bestie. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Abby, we need to get Abby to ask Lindsay what's going on. 
producer um, to the stars, Abby Mickelson. That's her yeah, actual title. I'm excited for Abby to go on, on if she's going to be on there because I think she's good talent. I agree. Uh, she's really um, – Channel 9 had her doing – Abby or Lindsay? Uh, Abby. Okay. Abby. Um, Chatfield <laughs> and our Abby is good talent too, of course. But um, <laughs> what about Abby Chatfield? <laughs> um, Abby Chatfield did a great job on the Channel Nine. Uh, was it the After Married at First Sight show she was doing? Yes, that was um, yeah. That was that was a real discovery, which I think has really helped her career. But here's my thing about Channel Ten. I think what we're seeing is a few pieces come together that is actually going to put 10 in the driver's seat in the coming years. And what I mean by that is if they do get the AFL, which I think they're a real chance of doing, Paramount that money. is going to be a major thing. Paramount money. Major. Yeah. Paramount I already bought money. stock in Paramount. Well, there you go. Um, you can day trade anyway. Then, then... They um they're trimming the fat, like getting rid of um, Bachelorette and things like that. But there seems to be a manoeuvre in the programming stakes. Didn't the other night they actually beat Channel 7 on the primary channel? Yep. Um, that happened. I know they've had bad Saturday nights. The A-League was a bad Monday night last week right? they beat them. And, and right. We're still waiting for NCIS Sydney. That's going to be amazing. That's going Maybe happen. that's why Sarah's still here. <laughs> so here's my great prediction. <laughs> I think a year or two ago, people like myself were ready to write Channel 10 off and um, do the eulogy. I'm not so sure anymore. I think that if these things come off, they're back in the driver's seat and could actually give the other networks a run for their money. It's all dependent on getting the AFL back. Oh, and Rob, without preempting our ratings chat that we will have, Monday nights with Have You Been Paying Attention and MasterChef on 10, if they could fix yep. their 6 to 7.30, honestly, bullshit. Um, well, they've got to throw it out and start again. I know, but, it, like, that is that is what is stopping them from winning a weeknight because they yeah. won everything up until about 10 o'clock, and they did last week. And and since Have You Been Paying Attention has arrived, and the cheap seats is not doing the same money, but it's doing good money nonetheless, that puts it in a similar position. Um, it's only been a resurgent Australian Story 7.30 that has given it a run for its money at 7.30. Yep, couldn't agree more. And um, I look forward to seeing what happens with 10 in the next uh, couple of years. I actually think it's going to be quite interesting. Well... If you're looking for a flasher, you don't need to head to the football. Just make sure you're on a Zoom call with Carrie Bickmore's husband. <laughs> Chris Walker, who runs the production company behind hits like The Weekly and Hard Quiz, has been caught not once but twice getting his gear off on a Zoom call. First was during a meeting that Carrie was having with the project producers and secondly in front of ABC staff, the second instance making headlines around the country. Both times have been put down as mistakes. However, ABC staff are said to be shocked, shocked. Shocked, I tell you, with some wanting action taken against the producer. It's understood no disciplinary action will be taken, which has, which has upset some staff, although they have been offered counselling if they need it. Right. Let's set some things straight. Like Chris did. <laughs> Thanks very much. Better than your intro, Robbo. <laughs> Here's the thing. This is someone with a... Um, a bone to pick. What's the wow? Expression? You have got to a rethink to what you are saying. A bone to pick, right? A boner to pick. This is someone with a bone to pick. Is that the expression? It, yeah. it, it, sure. Yeah. Not when you're talking about a naked man. Probably Rob. move away from that. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing. Guy has an accident. He has a meeting with his staff. He thinks the call's over. He gets up. He disrobes. He's getting in the shower for two minutes. Two minutes. People go. Oh, look, there's Chris. Oh, he's getting undressed. Oh, my. He's still undressed. He's still undressed. I'm shocked. I can't turn it off. I can't stop looking. I need counselling. Like, here's the problem. This is coming from someone, and I'm sorry to use that term, with a bone to pick because oh, in this is coming to internal <laughs> politics at the ABC. This isn't about people being upset or thinking disciplinary action needs to be taken. This is coming from someone who has a problem with this man or perhaps 
even the fact that outside productions are being used on ABC programs. This isn't about protection. This isn't about protecting him. He did nothing wrong except made a stupid mistake. Twice. And the simple fact is the yeah. people baying for blood who are leaking to the press are upset because they didn't get their way and Thinkative is still making shows for the ABC. We have, during COVID, had so many people who had to learn how to use Zoom. And we've had stories from every single country, from people young and old, who thought that they were over their Zoom or they weren't on a conference, like yep. they weren't on camera. Like There was like a 60-year-old lady in Mexico who was on a conference with the rest of her, like, people who worked in government and she, like, got her tits out. So, I mean... KFC have made an ad about it. Like, they've turned it into an advertising meme. It's a thing. Like, And, and look, just... this isn't like the guy, the lawyer at CNN who started having a handy with himself <laughs> during a meeting. This guy... What is going on? ...thought the meeting was over and was getting undressed for a shower. Completely different. Yeah, I mean, no. it's not like he's a comedian who's purposely, like, shaking the willy for everybody. I mean, this was I mean, a total that accident. But you know what comedian did that? I, I I I think this is he made the mistake twice. Anyone who's in television uh, knows from a very early age that there's always a hot mic and there's always a hot camera. I, I just think this is gross. The first time the it was leaked camera. by Carrie, so well, that's the thing. The so it's already been leaked. Did, I, did he know she had the camera on? That she is the knew question. that she was on a production meeting, and he walks out. She's a television presenter who's crossing back to Australia for her show. He then comes out naked without checking anywhere that maybe, just maybe, like she told him when they were having dinner the night before, that early in this morning for local time and Australian time, I'll be doing a live cross into the show that I used to host. He then comes out with his dick out. I, I just think, and then does it twice. This maybe is, I think it's on purpose. I think it's ridiculous. I think it's a well, fetish. Sorry, you're, are you suggesting for one minute that he flashed the ABC lovies on purpose. That's what Robert suggested. Who, who has a meeting, right, and then thinks in television who goes, oh, I just want to make sure that I'm going to have that uh, computer facing the shower but also facing where I'm going to get changed in front of. What a load of rubbish. I think a lot of people would shower after a TV meeting. <laughs> I don't believe it for a second. Twice? I don't I mean, think so. Finish? Robo, yes. Robbo, if you're having a meeting about ABC content, you need a shower. Oh, you. hang about. <laughs> it's got nothing what is going on. That was just a joke. It was a joke, okay. everybody. Can I just it's just weird. never going to get anything it's, at the ABC again. It's just <laughs> odd. I just think it's weird and it's just... Well, I think, I think you're like, all missing the point that Carrie and her husband are both nudists. <laughs> <laughs> they are. Carrie, Carrie mentioned on Would I Lie to You that she answered the door to one of her kids' schoolmates. Oh, that's right. They, it's, it's a whole family, it's a family fetish. Thing. Yeah. I'm telling you. Yeah, they're, they're just it. comfortable in their sexuality and their nakedness <sighs> and they just don't think about other people being frightened or terrified when they see them naked. And if they were Fred and Mary down the street, it wouldn't be a problem. I don't care what the Big Moors do behind the closed doors, but I don't want them shoving it down my throat. I don't oh, want to see Robo. it. Yes, I do. don't want to have Seriously. it. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> what is but, going on sorry, with can you we tonight? Just, as one final comment, the loveys needing counselling, like, are you serious? Oh, I don't Grow know that it was anyone needing counselling. Get over counseling. yourselves and get a real job. I don't think it was me. anyone needing counselling, Rob. The ABC <laughs> That's what made it available. Said. They were offering counselling. They like, made you offer counselling when you've got way. One or two people went on about the whole scenario and said, oh, this is outrageous. You've got to sack him. You've got to sack him. Oh, we'll give you some counselling. Well, the challenge is that the ABC can't sack him from his company. They can <laughs> say, we don't want to take your very popular TV show, which well, probably they won't do. Weirdly, they in their recap of the week, they missed that story. Oh, it might happen in this the week. Yeah. Mm, we'll see. Okay, after international border closures in 2020 and Sydney in lockdown in 2021, Australia's Got Talent is finally making its way back to our screens. It was almost a year ago to the day that Seven announced their all star lineup of judges with Neil Patrick Harris, Alicia Dixon, Kate Ritchie, and Shane Jacobson on the panel, rounded out by host Ricky Lee. The series had to be canned, and it turns out all but one star managed to stay the distance. Actor and Broadway performer Neil Patrick Harris will no longer be joining the team. He has instead been replaced by comedian David Williams. Sarah, what do you make of this? 
Did he get cancelled because the Amy Winehouse cake? (laughs) 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 Uh, So someone had tweeted, like Monk had tweeted this out, and someone had the funniest response because it's Australia's Got Talent, but not enough to have four Australian judges. Uh, There's just... Our networks don't open it up. You know, they don't discover the Ian Dicko Dixon. Remember You've when... You've got to uh, have... Like, they just can't have a show without having a foreign passport on it. I get it. Yeah, um, and, and look, remember, in the early days, Australian Idol put Dicko up and we found out his credentials and, and grew to love him. We don't do that anymore. It always has to be known faces. We don't establish new talent in this country, anyone. And, and look, I think the benefit to Williams being on that is that he, of course, has, um, you know, tenure uh, in Britain's Got Talent as a part of the judging panel there. So he's got form. He knows the format. Fans of the series will be excited to have him on board. Uh, and I'm sure that there are media frothing at the mouth to uh, interview uh, Mr. Williams because he's smart, Absolutely. he's funny, um, and certainly very self-deprecating. I think that's part of the attraction to having a Brit, you know, like I him. I can't on the, wait on the to panel. see him go on Sunrise and dress as Koshy and try to take over the show. I'm super excited to see Kate Ritchie on there because I, you know, always a fan when a child star grows up and becomes successful <laughs> on something and she's she's done i followed her career because we like we used to be the only kids who would go to channel seven parties yeah, so of course. like i love doing her. all that coke together yeah, yeah. yeah. Cola, obviously hookers you know, racking yes. up in the bathroom but yeah. no, I, I'm, I'm thrilled right. that she's doing it. And, um, you know, and I guess it's the former child star's time because they were going to have Lindsay Lohan on Mars Singer. So good for her. Power to her. I'm very happy. I don't care about anyone else. My only issue is do, if David Williams is on it, does that make Shane Jacobson the Simon Cowell? Because that doesn't He'll do anything for me. money. We know that already. <laughs> I don't know. It's a very good question. You don't seem to have your mean judge, do you? Well, who's this Alicia Dixon? What's her fault? She's from Britain's Got Talent. She's great. Yeah, but will she be yeah, the main judge she'll in She'll play the role of the international pop star with a heart of gold who he's, just loves everyone. He's sick, but he's that's sick. also what Kate Ritchie's doing. Mm. Oh, we might have a maybe, casting problem here. Maybe we're tired of bitchy judges and we're finally no. going for happy. No, we can't do that. I think it would be great if we actually just had nice people for a change. That's what Australian Idol's for. Whatever. Yeah, the biggest rating show is Married at First Sight. I don't think Australia's Maybe on your wavelength. Maybe this is the antithesis of that. It will be interesting, mm. Sarah, if your your theory postulated, in fact, is indeed the case. If they are going uber positive, like where everyone's the nice guy and they just want to see everyone succeed, to see how the out. audience responds to we're that. Just, we're just tired of bitchiness and we're, <laughs> we're going to have positivity for a minute. It, it would be an interesting turn and a welcome one, I'm sure. All right. Still to come on TV Black Box, a big name show gets the chop. We'll bring you our weekly ratings wrap and just what has everyone been watching this week? We'll find out when we head into the TV binge box. All right. Now it's time for Hatches and Dispatches with me, Sarah. Yay! (laughs) Men, if you're looking for roses and television love, think again. The home of reality TV love, Network 10, has announced there will be no season of The Bachelorette this year. Despite the show being included in 10's upfronts, Big Boss Bev has confirmed it will be screening this year. <laughs> Knock me over with a feather at those things. I loved writing that line, I'll tell you. I can't say Big Boss Bev. I think yes, she I just can. Did, she's Rob. a big, she's a boss, and she's a Bev. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it, I suppose. You watch that stick around the halls of 10. Right. <laughs> Big Boss Bev. Yeah. I've Big had fun this week. Bev. Big <laughs> Boss Bev. All right. <laughs> the comedy world's favourite Melbourne solicitor is back. Fisk is currently in production with star and creator Kitty Flanagan front and centre. All your favourite performers are back, including Aaron Chen, Julia Zamiro, and Marty Sheargold. Fisk Season 2 will premiere on the ABC later this year. Sound the siren, the end of an era is here. He's been the voice of sport and in particular rugby league for over 55 years, but Ray Rabbits Warren is switching off the mic. The celebrated broadcaster has called 45 NRL Grand Finals and 99 State of Origins. He'll remain part of the World Wider Sports family. And that is this week's Hatches and Dispatches. Thank you, Sarah. Big news with Rabs not uh, continuing to get behind the mic. Uh, mm. Sad news. Could have hit his 100th 
State of Origin um, tomorrow night as we record this podcast. A real, real shame, actually. He he will be involved. Sorry. I was going to say he will be involved, though, Rob, as a part of a a, a prepared package that Nine are doing with his views on the game, but he won't be calling it. And he thought the number 99 was just more exciting than 100. He said he has nothing to prove and got on him. To the ratings race now, very little change in the ratings game with Team Red clocking up another weekly win with a 29.7% share. Team Blue was second with 26.1. The 10 Network had an 18.3 share, while ABC sat on 16.6. SBS was on 9.3. To primary channels and 7 easily won the week on 20.3%, 9 on 17.9. ABC continues to sit in third position on 11.9, but 10 was right behind on 11.6. 7, SBS was down the back on 5.1. 7-2 was a clear winner in the multi-channels. Sunrise continues to reign over today and 7 News won the weekly 6pm news battle. The Voice and Have You Been Paying Attention were the star performers from the week. The A-League is over and 10 was able to move back into fourth position on Saturday. What brought them back to fourth place? Two repeats of Bondi Rescue, two repeats of the Doghouse UK, an encore of the Cheap Seats and two repeats of Ambulance Australia. Yep, folks. That lineup proved more popular by over double of how many people would watch the A-League. I don't know if it's an embarrassment for 10, actually. It's an embarrassment for the A-League. All right, Aaron, what are your thoughts on the ratings? Well, with that A-League stuff, I just want to say maybe there is some love in the air for Bev McGarvey. I think Big when boss it comes... Bev. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I think when it comes... <laughs> When it comes to leadership, honesty is important. Um, I've liked how the network has allowed shows like Have You Been Paying Attention and Cheap Seats to poke fun of the network. So in relation to the A-League ratings, um, she said, uh, and I was on a TV Tonight article, um, that's fair, Dan Monaghan and I haven't been loving Sunday mornings, obviously in, in reference to seeing the dire ratings on Saturday. I mean, you just need to call it. That's how it is. It, it, it's been, um, it's been bad. she was honest. Yeah, James Warburton obviously does it a lot. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll call out something if he needs to. But, um, yeah, it's it's dire that those sort of repeat programs can be stronger than the A-League. Um, so, but we were talking before um, about 10. Um, the only thing I'll add is I've been saying for over a year, if you look at that 7.30 p.m. to 9.30, 10 o'clock sort of slot, 10 would be probably winning um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays and Thursday nights. Um, and they've been doing that for, for, for quite a while. Oh, not um, Wednesdays, but yes. Well, Wednesday nights have been doing okay with, with um, uh, Master Chef and, and five, five Bedrooms. I mean, Seven have only had Britain's Got Talent and stuff afterwards. ABC's and... been thrashing it. Everyone. Oh, ABC's well, yeah. been thrashing everyone on Wednesday. I was... They don't care about ratings. Yes, yeah, so I was talking about <laughs> the, the commercials. But, sure. yeah, I, th- sorry. I think that, sorry, that, they've been doing well, so... Yeah. Um, It's interesting. I was having a conversation with someone this week talking about Sunrise and this bizarre narrative of Sunrise not doing well, which is obviously not the truth. I know know News Breakfast had a good day and beat it in the five-cap cities, but I actually think sometimes we need to acknowledge just how well that show is doing. Um, We can talk about diminishing audiences and all that kind of stuff across television. I would argue Breakfast TV holds in there better than primetime as far as audience retention. But Sunrise has been a powerhouse for so many years now and continues to be the strongest breakfast show on Australian television. And that doesn't happen by accident, especially when you've got Today and News Breakfast throwing everything at it. So... It was interesting having that conversation. This was obviously with someone at seven, but I agree with them, you know, uh, this because there has been a lot of narrative saying Sunrise is losing and and the perception that you take away from it is that the show is falling apart when it's not. Sunrise is shrinking, but all the breakfast shows are shrinking. So is all of television. Yeah, yeah. well, the challenge is that, you know, it's just noticeable. I mean, look, both... Weekend today, as we talked about last week and, and a few weeks ago, Sunrise proper have new executive producers. So mm. I think there's going to be – it's early days, right? You don't come in and change everything on the ship in your first week. Um, and Sean, as the example for Sunrise, is a smart operator. I think that we will start to see the benefit of his youthful experience. Under Sarah Stinson, who I yeah, greatly admire. Absolutely. Uh, we'll see that play out in about six to 12 months' time. We're not going to see it now. And you it's know. evolution, not revolution. 
excellent buzz phrases, Rob. I'm good at them. As I alluded to before, Rob, the the interesting play, and it, it's it's like Aaron said, commercially, it's it's a really interesting situation when we mix in SBS and the ABC. Um, seven thirty in Australian Story, seven thirty and Hard Quiz, seven thirty and Gruen. Um, th- they've been winning prime time. And then when you follow it up, have you been paying attention to a great business on Mondays, um, the weekly, including, well, maybe not including, but EP by the Naked One, um, is doing good business to, <laughs> paired with You Can't Ask That on Wednesdays. Um, it's really, we were almost in that half and half week again where it's the sport ruling, you know, Friday, Saturday, sometimes Thursday, and then who's got the best of what. The, the challenge is that with the Queen's, Platinum Jubilee party that Seven ran on Sunday night. That's Those numbers are some of the best numbers we've seen since the Married at First Sight finale on Sunday I night. I really enjoyed the Queen's Jubilee party. That was great. The Paddington skit was excellent. And if the Logie skit can be anywhere near as half as good as that, I will recant on all of my concerns. It won't be. Well. It won't be. Thanks, Philip. I agree. Uh, and on that note, TV Black Box will have special coverage of the Logies on June 19. We will be on the red carpet talking to the celebrities as they come down. We will have ongoing coverage throughout the night in a special series of articles. So make sure you watch those. You'll see the embedded videos and keep across our YouTube page for all the uploads. Ooh. That's tvblackbox.com.au. All right. It's time to open the TV binge box and find out what everybody's been watching. Aaron, what have you been watching? Well, I unfortunately have, have had COVID, so I've oh. been watching a yeah, I've been watching a few things. You've been watching like, heaps. Uh, a little, little more than usual. So I watched um, Stranger Things. So I finally I watched all the seven episodes there. I just didn't maybe because I was sick, but I just didn't find it as good as the previous seasons. It just feels like it's the same thing, sort of going around in a circle but anyway um i also watched a series on prime video called the the summer i turned pretty i just saw that advertised i saw the word pretty in the title so I... <laughs> the subtitle is a life of robo <laughs> so so i watched it and it was it, it was okay it's just it's just about the, these families that come together every summer but they've been growing up you know obviously you know since, since they were born but now they're kind of like 16 17 18 and now they're the, the, the brothers and the other girl that comes have all got eyes for each other and she doesn't know which brother to go for and it just goes around in a circle. It was okay. So seven episodes. Um, I've been watching Celebrity Apprentice. I've um, really been enjoying that. Channel 9 haven't been putting up any more episodes up. Oh, so I haven't, haven't been a preview, so I'll have to actually so watch <laughs> tonight's episode Like a live. normal person. Live. I'm going to watch that in 33 minutes if this podcast ever finishes. Um, (laughs) It's not going to happen. It's a big one tonight. And, of course, um, Big Brother. um, It it had a really good chat this week with... um, with Sam, who, who who got evicted, and of course she was involved with Josh and then Drew and all that kind of stuff. So that was kind of a very revealing uh, sort of interview with her, and it was uh, it was good. So that's about it for me, Philip. Uh, well, look, I've been I've been continuing on with Sons of Anarchy on Foxtel, and I've now finished the seven series. Good choices. Uh, and look, it's a brilliant piece of television, but I would warn anyone that hasn't watched it that the violence only gets worse. I had to, you know, shield my eyes several times. And there's also just no element of redemption whatsoever in that show. So if you like one of the characters, I can guarantee you they're going to turn out to be bad, okay? So so don't go there with any hopes up. Um, I also, a couple of weeks ago, I said don't, don't watch Hacks again because it had sort of lost its mo- mojo. I've now watched a few more episodes. I'm recanting that as... You would say, Malk, uh, it's got its heart back. It's really funny and just heartwarming, and I enjoyed it. And the other show, which I've been desperate to watch, which I've been watching on Foxtel, is uh, Series 25 of Silent Witness, which is a British crime show that's been going since, oh, God, 1996. It's a sort of show that it, it jumped the shark for me a few years ago when it stopped being about police procedural stuff and started to be about, all about the personal lives of the characters, which me and a bunch of other fans really hated. 
Uh, it's brought back one of the original cast members in this 25-year anniversary series, uh, and it's really interesting, lots of twists and turns, a lot better than the last three or four years is what I would say. So I'd recommend that one. Sarah? So it's not TV, but we went to the premiere of Moulin Rouge this week. And it was fucking amazing. But you can't talk about it, Sarah. I'm sorry. It was this is a so television good. podcast. No, because here's the thing. While I was watching myself on all the news programs in the morning, um, they had the thing for Moulin Rouge. And so we watched all of the thing that was leading up to it. And then we actually went and saw it. And it was the best thing. Like my husband, who's a Texan and very manly, manly and hates musicals, gave them a standing ovation. So Excellent go see that and then yeah otherwise um i really just haven't had time to watch tv this week because i was busy making it so <laughs> you're amazing on the current affair sarah i really well thank you thought you handled yourself very well they almost got the tears they were trying <laughs> <laughs> i thought you did just fine uh, no. <laughs> wow <laughs> rob mcknight uh, um... producer to the no ones <laughs> no, Sarah did a great job and now she can finally move on and be Sarah. Yep. Uh, Robbo, what have you been watching? I've been watching a wonderful show by Stephen Merchant called The Outlaws on Amazon Prime. It's a six episode series. It is fantastic. Uh, you think it's a comedy? Well, I went into it thinking it was just a comedy, but it's it's a heist movie, it's uh, a thriller, it's, it's a heaps, mystery. Isn't it? And it's funny. It's it's fantastic. Uh, the other season, season two, is apparently being released in August. Yep. Um, it is fantastic. So watch that if you've got Amazon Prime. I've also started, I'm a little bit late, uh, on a little show. I don't know if you've heard of it, called Mad Men. Uh, I've just started watching it uh, on the series. stand. Oh, it is. It is fantastic. Is it, it is brilliant. What's it about? Yeah, really, really good. Yeah, it's about I don't know some you hot guy called John Hamm. Better explain the concept Hamm. to us because no none of spoilers us know though. It. Rob yeah. will kill you. <laughs> well, it's an alien dressed in a suit and he does advertising. Uh, so, oh, I hope I didn't ruin it. Oh, no. uh, it's fantastic. I'm loving it. Uh, that's what I've been watching. Good choices, Robert. I have been watching Hacks, Philip. Yes. Because you were talking about it, I've taken a look at it on Stan. And I'm watching the first season at the moment, really liking it. Very good. Um, I've watched the first two episodes of Ms. Marvel, which I think is premiering on Disney Plus tomorrow night. Um, Malk told me that. Thank you very much, Malk. Um, it's a great series. It's very different from other Marvel superhero film movies and films and TV shows. It's just, but it's fantastic. It's got a heart. I really, really love it. Um, we watched... The Queen's Platinum Jubilee Party, which I just thought was really good. Here's the thing with that. Fantastic production. The use of three stages, very well thought out. Everything was brilliant except the directing. The directing was shut. They should have brought in an Aussie to do it. Uh, Aussies know how to do event, live event television. Whoever directed this was obviously the work experience kid who wouldn't be able to get a job in Australia. I thought despite having 50 cameras, everything you could want, this person did not know how to direct an arsehole. So um, <laughs> just as well, the arsehole was low on the run sheet. <laughs> and it wasn't um, the how. I, I just thought that was the only thing that wrecked such a great event. And it was a great event with really bad directing. Really bad. Like, I'm not even talking slightly bad. I'm talking like, go back to school and learn your craft bad. Was it right? worse than the bushfire appeal? Oh, Rob can't say. Uh, okay. I've also been watching Star Trek Lower Decks on Amazon Prime Video, how Excellent. I've been watching and really, really enjoying. Yes. And like you, Sarah, you went to the premiere of Moulin Rouge. I went to the Brisbane premiere of 9 to 5. Oh. What a fabulous treat. And, Robbo, all I could think about was that time you and I met Ms Dolly Parton in New Zealand when she's we went amazing. there for an interview with her. Yep, she's wonderful. She's beautiful. And that show, I've listened to that soundtrack for years and I can't wait to see it. And people who've listened to this podcast will have heard the story where I had to spend seven minutes trying to fill conversation with uh, Dolly while I w waited for the aforementioned David Robinson and host Sarah Harris to arrive <laughs> because Dolly turned up late and her manager, and I said, you're early. And her manager said, Dolly's never early. She's on time. 
Mm. Oh, yes. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Seven minutes. I ha- I got to speak to Dolly. Couldn't tell you anything I said. All right, Mal, bring us home. <laughs> um, uh, what did you watch? Well, I, yeah, I finished season two of Hacks. Now, I struggled through season one. I didn't really get it until about episode seven. Um, but I persevered. And at that See, point, I, I thought it was... I would never last that long if I didn't like a show. I would yeah, be out. Well, the challenge was that someone said, no, 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 stick with it, Mal. You, you know, and, uh, and I... In retrospect, when I okay, I see what they tried to do. They just took seven eps to get to the good stuff. Um, season two it was ups and downs for me. But, look, I, I still give it a thumbs up. Hacks on Stan, two seasons. It's worth starting if you haven't already started it. I and, like and Rob. Mo, yes? You, we should explain it's not a story about computer hackers like I assumed no, it was. No, correct. It is not about the it crowd. Um, I really did. Is... <laughs> Holy shit. Um, <laughs> yes, no, it's, it's comedian hacks. <laughs> Bad joke tellers. Um, I, like Rob, was fortunate enough to see the first two episodes of Ms. Marvel, and all I can encourage you is if you are a Marvel fan, this is great. Like, this is into the Spider-Verse kind of a new yeah. way of telling a story. The aesthetic is really smart. I'm loving oh, the, yeah. the, the, the um, design. The the I think it's Pakistani. I apologise if I've got that wrong. Uh, the the subcontinent connection, the family, the way all of that stuff works together. The the fact that she's a Muslim is front and centre. Uh, I re- I really dig it. I think it's a really great tale. Um, I also got to see the first six episodes of The Boys, uh, with three episodes that started last Friday on Prime Video. What a series! I, wow. I, I was Just I was wow. watching. I forgot that on my list, Mark. I, I'm still on episode three so yes. everyone's ahead of me now because i haven't what finished episode three but i that series is just so brilliant confronting hilarious the darkest of comedies it's a really great series on prime video and worth watching the first two seasons to get to it you would not really keep up if you started on season three um so that's there i like aaron um, our family watched Stranger Things. My two teenagers, my wife and I, have sat down and got through that, and I loved it. I thought it was – I agree there was a part probably early in the season, Aaron, where it kind of felt a bit same-same, um, though I thought that episode four really brought it home. I thought that that was right. I get this now. I understand where the Duffer brothers are taking it. I do feel lied to because I can, look, hand on heart tell you that I read media from Netflix saying that this season of – Stranger Things is the last one. And then five days ago, the Duffer Brothers came out and said, no, no, season five next year is the last one. Jerks. Um, hmm. That's fine. It means we get more Stranger Things. But um, it's it's an interesting situation because I came into this thinking, right, this is it. We're solving it. We're working it out. Um, just as breaking news, by the way, Bert, uh, Brett Goldstein, who's one of the writers and stars of Ted Lasso, has announced in an interview today that season three of Ted Lasso will be its last. Um, so heads up for fans of that series on Apple TV+. Plus. The I, I watched Girls Ever, a Girls Five Ever on stand and was surprised how much I laughed at it. A really excellent, um, no laugh track sitcom. It's, it's really quite funny, really sharp. Loving the Orville on SBS Viceland. And the big one I want to mention on my way out, apart from John Oliver's request to the Yarra Council to sell him their now defaced banana statue, um, and he's going to give them his crocodile flap, you know, uh, flipping the bird that's been pointed at Dr. O- Dr. Oz's office. That's on last night's episode. It's very funny. Um, Obi-Wan Kenobi on Disney+. Plus. Hot oh, yeah. damn. Yeah, love it. Love it. Love the, it love I'm it. back in. The little girl right. that's playing Leah, give her an Emmy now. She oh, is, she is yep. spectacular. Yeah. Doing Bring such a great in. job. The tale yeah. that they have written is brilliant. At yeah. this point, I would say to you, Disney can do no wrong with their Star Wars television stuff. It's really going great. Um, the first three episodes are out. Episode four drops this week. There's only six. This is a limited series. So there's only six episodes. Um, I would be deathly surprised if she doesn't at least get nominated, the, uh, the young actress who plays Leia, mm. Um, mm. next year. Well, Thank last you, week I said I was unsure, I wasn't convinced. Episode three got me back in, so I'm back in the tent. Malt, thank you very much. All right, well, that brings us to the end of TV Black Box for another week. Thank you for your company. We look forward to dissecting the television industry with you next week. And don't forget, in the meantime, if you want to know what's happening, go to tvblackbox.com.au. It's where people in the industry get their news. 